Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Thank you very much for seeing us this evening uh, to hear this project. Um, I want to just introduce myself for those that may not know in the audience. My name is David Malesko. I'm the Director of Leisure Services here for the Town of Bloomfield. Um, we're here this evening to present on the Farmington River Park. Um, and here I'd like to introduce or to, to recognize our chair, Louis Blumenfeld, and our vice chair, uh, Paula Jones. Um, we also have our consultant uh, from uh, Boston O'Neill, Stephanie White, that is here with us this evening. She'll actually be taking us through the presentation. Um, but I just want to say a couple words prior to that. Uh, we've been working on this property for several years now. Um, we've been working with with Crack as part of it, as, as a potential uh, leasey of, 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 uh, of the, as part of the property. Um, we've been doing that for the last several years and finally we decided that it would be in the best interest for the town and the park as a whole if we came up with a plan uh, for this property so about about 12 months ago um, at the direction of, of the council um, and the manager we've uh, we came to the Parks and Recreation Committee and um, we went through we vetted out we did an RFP process through there and uh, through that we selected uh, uh, um, Foss and O'Neill to manage the property for us so I don't want to go on too much right now. There'll be plenty of questions and answers afterwards. Um, I'd like to introduce Stephanie to come on up and to go through the presentation with everybody. Um, and then I'll be back up to help out with uh, so many add-ons um, and answer questions. So here's Stephanie. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good evening. And again, for the record, um, I'm Stephanie White. I'm a licensed landscape architect with the consulting firm Fuss and O'Neill um, in Manchester, Connecticut. And I'm just happy to be here tonight to share with you our final recommendations of the master planning process that we've been working on over the last nine months. Um, it's been a great collaborative effort that we've had between um, town staff and uh, the committee as well as uh, the citizens and as well as some of members of you. Um, and we're uh, pleased with the, the outcome of our plan and uh, the vision that we are setting forth for the future of the park. Um, so just um, the way the presentation structured, just trying to keep it concise. Um, and we're going to just uh, go through four kind of different steps. We'll briefly review the process in which the master plan took. Uh, the, the plan, we'll review the actual plan. Um, and its recommendations, and then we'll discuss about, um, you know, we have all these great ideas, how do we get there? What are those initial first steps we take? And, um, you know, what are the costs um, associated with them? Uh, so for those of you who are not aware of where the park is, and, and during some of our outreach, we discovered a lot of people in town uh, weren't aware that this park existed or where it was actually located. So it's located um, in the northeast corner of town. It's on the border of uh, the East Granby and Windsor uh, town line, uh, right off of Tungsis Avenue. And it's, it's 70 acres of, a, of a beautiful woodland right adjacent to um, the Farmington River. And um, it's been town owned since 1995. And um, as you'll see, we feel it's been pretty underutilized uh, over the last number of years and has great potential um, to become much more of a, a town-wide and regional asset. So why master plan? Our, our mission for this master plan was really to work collaboratively and to come up with a shared vision for its park's future. Um, and really, again, to make it much more of this uh, town-wide asset and regional asset um, than it is today. And during our master plan process, we uh, set out these four key ingredients that we felt uh, were needed to make this park plan successful. We didn't want this plan to sit on a shelf. We wanted it to be realistic. We wanted it to be implementable. And we felt these four key ingredients um, were the way for us to get there. And that was we needed to engage the public. We needed to make sure it was uh, had linkages and connectivity. It wasn't just looking at the park site itself, looking at uh, its surrounding uh, area and uses, have really good ideas, and to be realistic, that it can be, um, it can be phased, it can be implemented. 
and uh, through that process was five steps process in which we started out in an investigation and evaluation phase um, which then led us to going out to the community and doing some community outreach um, and hearing uh, feedback and taking that feedback and um, vetting it on the plan investigating exploring those ideas the landing on the plan um, and figuring out the phasing and the estimation, and which is landing us here today to step five, in which we are issuing um, and delivering our final master plan to you. Um, just briefly, some of the uh, investigation and evaluation um, takeaways that we we um, we saw when we were out on the in the park for our first uh, visit. Um, as you can see, um, some of the, the drawbacks initially were, um, you know, we felt it was hidden, right? You didn't even know it existed. Um, it was underutilized. It was informal. There was no formalization of any trail system. Um, there was ATV usage that we saw in some of the degradation of these uh, stream crossings, as you can see on the bottom of your screen, uh, through the ATV usage. Um, invasive species, uh, that would need to be addressed, especially in around where the house is out there today. That's been where uh, most of the disturbance has occurred, and that's where uh, most of the uh, invasive species will need to be addressed. But the assets, uh, we felt, just outweighed them. I mean, you have this incredible river access here on the property. Um, it, this is the part of the river where it's upstream of from the Windsor Dam, so it's a very calm, um, picturesque piece, perfect for kayaking as you can see in the top, on the top photo. Um, and we just felt that with the river access and the scenic vistas uh, had, had so much potential to be more than it is today. Oops, did I do that? Yep. Um, and one of those other key ingredients was connectivity. We said, okay, you know, let's look at this. What is the surrounding uses? Are there opportunities to connect it to become a larger whole? And the opportunities of you know the East Coast Greenway, right off to the east, Northwest Park, that great expansive uh, passive park to our west, and then we have our corporate institutes to the south. Um, you know, are there opportunities to connect those? And we felt there were, um, very much so that you know an easy connection to the East Coast Greenway, providing another alternate mode of transportation to get to uh, the park so it's not just car usage, um, connecting the town of Windsor's Northwest Park with Farmington River Park, linking them up through a river trail. And then there's the corporate institutes. Um, I was out there uh, at noontime uh, observing and you know the floodgates open of those offices and they all come out on the spring day ready to walk. And they're walking along the access roads. But I said to myself, my gosh, if these people knew that they had this park right here in their back door, they would be out there using it. Um, I would be if I knew it, and I'd be having my, bringing my lunch down there and sitting by the river. Um, so it's a huge asset um, that I think there's a um, relationship with the corporate institutes that can happen. Um, and again, this would be some of the logistics on how those linkages could t to occur in terms of the East Coast Greenway connection, we would be looking at providing a signage at the tr uh, between the intersection of Duncaster Road and where the trail crosses, um, and bringing from Duncaster Road over into Tunxis Ave, uh, a bike system to get you to the park. Those two roads are pretty low, uh, low speed roads, so there's probably an opportunity there, whether it's a Shero or maybe some restriping to get uh, more of a bike, bike, bike friendly um, access to the park. Um, the river trail that we were discussing and how to connect it to Northwest Park, the adjacent properties off to the east is uh, Connecticut Deep owns the property to the east, so that would be viable. The Great Pond um, property, and then there's the Windsor Bloomfield landfill. So a, a very viable connection that can occur there. Um, and then our this is our kind of where we've culminated as our final plan. And that was, you know, vetted through um, a month worth of uh, community outreach, which we did user surveys. We had pop-up surveys throughout multiple um, locations and municip municipal buildings um, in town. 
as well as a workshop that I know many of you partaked with, as well as uh, the public was invited for an hour session and, and the committee. Um, so this is a kind of a culmination of, uh, of those results. Um, and really, what we're looking to achieve here is, is to kind of just um, keep the nature state of the park, but just formalize it more. We're not looking and proposing anything too drastic. It's, it's a beautiful, pristine uh, piece of property. And really just to formalize it, make it a little bit more active, provide a, a more passive amenities than there are out there today. Um, so what we're looking to do is there's um, currently an access drive that gets you to the existing uh, house. And that is closed off today. What we're recommending is that to be reopened so that allows cars to come into what we're calling the heart of the park in that red circle area. What that will allow is um, we see that where that existing house is and pond really the, the main hub of activity. That's where you have at grade river access, perfect location to launch kayaks and canoes from. Um, it's that area sit up, it sits up a little bit high from the topography and provides great expansive views. There's a reason why someone built their house there on that property of those 70 acres. It's a prime great location. And we see is just really expanding kind of the amenities of that area in the heart of the park. So allowing cars to come into this area have an informal parking area, um, have the road be gravel, have the parking areas be gravel, um, keep it casual so that uh, cars can come in and take their kayaks off the, their car and launch their kayaks in that area and for, um, and for picnicking. Um, it was much deliberated with the committee um, in terms of what to do with the house and after much deliberations and vetting lots of different ideas, um, it's been determined and recommended for this plan that the house uh, be demolished and in its place and its same footprint, uh, a new picnic pavilion, uh, partial enclosed picnic pavilion, uh, be built in its footprint, uh, activating that park and providing um, another uh, activity in that space. We also wanted to address uh, adding additional trails and more formalizing the trails, adding more trail network. And you can see in the white dots there, um, that would be expanded trail network. The yellow uh, line there is more of a formalized river trail that would connect then future into uh, Northwest Park. And then we also need to address the ATV, ATV issue that I, I mentioned. Um, we want to really reduce the conflicts that a hiker and a ATV usage could uh, occur. So we are looking at restricting um, ATV usage to one kind of trail system that would be signed um, and that would help try to lessen the degradation of the stream crossings and the opportunities for conflicts um, between uh, the hikers and the, the, the ATVers. And we're really trying to get them. They're using a lot of Connecticut Deeps land and they're kind of cutting through uh, the park right now. We're trying to get them and push them up towards the pipeline. They use the pipeline. That's their main corridor. That's where they like to rip. So just getting them as quickly as possible up that pipeline and getting them off of the remainder of the park is the goal. And again, the parking area off of Tungsis Ave would remain. That's a paved parking area. And that would remain. That would be the main entrance uh, into the park. And here is just uh, an enlargement of what we would see the heart of the park taking shape. So uh, the building there would be um, a new enclosed uh, picnic shelter would be of the same footprint as the existing house. And we would be keeping um, the existing chimney in the house and building the enclosed structure around it to just kind of have that historical piece uh, of the house um, remain intact. We're looking at adding, you know, the, the picnic pavilion could have a nice uh, porch off the back that would provide expansive views to the, uh, to the river. Um, the kayak launch at that at grade cross, uh, at grade uh, location with a, a more formalized uh, pathway to get down there and really kind of um, centralizing that cent kayak launch so that people aren't willy-nillying, cutting through different parts along the riverbank to get down and, and drop their kayak in. So we're restricting uh, one area so that the remainder of the riverbank can re um, remain untouched. Um, and then you can see that drop-off area. That's the existing uh, footprint of the, uh, the turnaround that it is today and really just kind of 
uh, an unformalized parking area uh, to allow um, cars to come in, uh, use the picnic pavilion, the kayak launch, and um, which I'll kind of show some images later, but the idea of introducing maybe kayak storage and rentals uh, to the space as well as, as an open lawn and um, informal picnic area. Um, so here are some of the recommendations um, that we're recommending in supporting of the heart of the park. This would be the at-grade um, kayak launch. And you can see on the right-hand side, that's the existing photo of where that would occur today on the park. And on the left is a precedent image of, of what that could look like. Very informal, just a gravel, kind of widened out space with signage, proper signage, letting people know um, this is where you come in and, and bring your kayak into the river. Um, we also wanted to um, recommend um, ways to diversify the age groups in the park and uh, help provide a place for um, children's play area adjacent to the picnic pavilion. And this wouldn't be a, um, you know, a, a formalized children's play structure that you're used to seeing. Um, there's been a, a big movement in um, getting kids back into nature, uh, letting them use their imagination more with technology. They're, they're not being as imaginative as we were as kids. So um, the idea of really reusing a lot of maybe some of the tree clearing that would occur, reusing those materials for uh, kids to play in, um, and you know these kind of fun, whimsical uh, willow structures. But just the, the idea that look keeps with that nature-based uh, park. And then in terms of materials, you know, again, keeping it uh, that rustic uh, nature-based park feel delineating the parking areas with on-site boulders or wooden guide rails, um, reusing potentially some of the fallen uh, trees or tree clearing to build log benches and um, enclosing, kind of formalizing and closing the porta potties. They'll be needed in that heart of the park but not having them be so unsightly and close them in a wood structure. I did? Okay. I know this isn't here. This is definitely not. Oh, what? Where did it? Why didn't it? Yes. Okay. Where did? Okay. I know it didn't show. Okay, mystery slide. But anyhow, yes. So this is our precedent image of the um, enclosed, uh, partial enclosed picnic pavilion, and uh, this image off to the left here is um, it was it's Mohegan Park in Norwich. Uh, Connecticut, it unfortunately doesn't look like this as today, but it's a historic photo and it's very, um, very similar to what we have today in terms of the vistas to the river, using that existing chimney, um, building the pavilion around it, having a nice kind of uh, uh, open porch uh, facing out towards the river. So we kind of are using this as our guide and inspiration of what that enclosed uh, picnic pavilion would look like. Hopefully that. I didn't miss any more. I don't know why this is. Oh, um, I know I felt off. <laughs> um, and then we also wanted to suggest some revenue generation opportunities that could be um, in part of the plan so that it could help offset some of the maintenance costs that will uh, be needed for the park upkeep. Um, so in terms of the pavilion that we just showed, we feel that that would be a way to bring in some rental income. Um, the Connecticut Deep uh, park system, they charge for their rentals and we see this as being a well-desired amenity in town that people would pay for uh, a Saturday or Sunday rental. Um, I know in speaking with Dave, the, the pool pavilion is very highly desired and we feel that this would be as well in a way to help uh, bring in some extra money for the maintenance. Um, the idea of trail sponsorship, so we talked about those corporate institutes to the south. Um, we feel that maybe a partnership with them and having them sponsor a trail to keep the maintenance um, and maintaining those trails. They are very much in tune to wellness programs. There's a big initiative for wellness programs, physical health and mental health, and this park would provide uh, both of those um, amenities. I am skipping a slide. I'm missing, a, did I? No? Okay. 
There was, oh, oh this one. Okay, this is okay. We're here. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, we talked about the child's play area, but also another uh, way to bring children into the park is the idea of a storybook walk. And if you haven't heard of those, they're about a half mile looping walk system. And you would have, uh, you know, you par partner with Prosper uh, Library. And each month, they would there'd be a stanchion um, along the trail system. And each, in each stanchion, there'd be a page or two of the story. And, and as you walk, the story would unfold. So either the caregiver or the child could read the story um, and make that walking loop system. It's great for literacy advocacy as well as um, you know just exercise and wellness and being in nature. So we feel that would be a great added asset uh, to the park and also help promote uh, more users to come into the park. Um, and then obviously formalizing the trail system. Right now there you go there and there's some informal trails. You don't know where it's going to take you. You know, having trail markers, having trail signage, having a trail mark when you arrive to the park. There's a, a sense of arrival. You can you can plan out your visit. Uh, would be a much needed benefit. And then obviously the the ATV signage. You know, getting those signs up and designating that trail just for the ATV usage uh, would be important. So we have all these great ideas, and so you know, how do we get them implemented, and what are the costs? Um, so this is kind of where we see um, our phase one initiative would occur. Uh, number one priority would be improve the culvert crossing that um, that access drive would take you into the heart of the park. We want to open that up immediately and get people to use the uh, at grade um, uh, river trail uh, the the kayak access. Uh, the second would be, you know, demoing the house and looking to uh, construct the partial enclosed picnic pavilion. Um, and then formalizing a little bit more of the heart of the parks, parking space, uh, clearing um, some of the trails and for the kayak launch and opening up those views and uh, providing the signage uh, for the trail system. So that would be, you know, roughly uh, what phase one would be. You know, we're not asking for approval of any kind of budget tonight. It's really just an approval of the adopt adaptation of, of the, the master plan itself. Um, that's just one thing I just forgot to mention. I was talking all about that trail signage. Um, the other revenue generation idea was uh, the idea of kayak storage and kayak rental. So, um, you know, the main asset and the main feature of this park is there's river access. So we want to really want to play that up. And a lot of people either can't afford a kayak or don't want the, the burden of unloading and loading a kayak or have the storage space. So providing either storage, a storage system at the parks where they can rent out a locker and store their kayak for the season. Or um, as you can see in this picture below, this is in Minnesota with the National Park Service. They have a rent a, a kayak program, almost like a bike share. And it's all digital with all sorts of technology through your phone. And you get a passcode to unlock the kayak, which comes with a life preserver vest and, and paddle. And you, know, you pay for the rental, and you put it back. And um, we just see that as being a great feature and asset uh, addition to uh, a park and a way to help um, bring in a, some additional money. Um, so with that, that concludes our uh, master plan. And uh, at this time, we'd love to hear uh, some of your questions and uh, feedback as well. <laughs> um. Hi. First, I'm not sure I have any questions. I do have a, a comment. Um, I'm really thrilled to see this park finally making its way into the community life of Bloomfield after 24 years. And uh, having you know, intimate knowledge of it for many of those 24 years, of the early years when I was walking my dog there, I know how special this place is. And I think it, it will be attractive to all residents of Bloomfield. And I, I, I compliment you on a couple things. One is the you know, concept of user fees and trying to get corporate involvement in this is very important going forward. I mean, obviously, this park has been sitting uh, un un unloved for so long because of financial situations. Perhaps it would have gone 
faster it might have been developed sooner if it were built when we first bought it but times are different now so we have to be a little more careful so I, I really applaud you on that uh, facility rentals uh, for the for the for parties and that sort of thing I guess that's part of the, the issue as well so I uh, I just one question I do have is that there are larger boats on this river power boats huge boats but power boats is uh, will the launch accommodate them as well as uh, kayaks or what are you thinking no we weren't proposing any power boat launch it was strictly uh, more of a kayak okay. canoe type access okay yeah. I just had they, no, problem. They would use, no problem with that they would use Windsor's launch yep. for that that okay. sort of thing yeah thank you thank you for your work thank you yes I I, I want to compliment you as well on a, a very professional job and I really like what you planned. I'm hoping we can get it so we can uh, actually drive a car down and back it down. There is an area where there's a grade that make it possible to back down right to the river and not have to drag a, a kayak uh, eighth of a mile, to, which is make, takes all the fun out of it. So I appreciate that part of it. And um, I also have a great hope that we have this trail along the river. You mentioned it going to Northwest Park. Well. I'd like to see it go the other way to Terrafell as well, where it would, of course, actually, uh, a, a, as a pathway or maybe eventually as a bike path, might join the uh, intersect with the uh, East Coast Greenway. So I, I think, but I think, I think what you've done there is great. Um, the the East Coast Greenway arrow there should go a little more over to the right. <laughs> you have it going up the mountain, but that's okay. <laughs> But basically, it, it goes along, uh, approaches the river over to the right. And um, so it, that, would be, that would be great if we can see. I, I look, look at this as part of a connectivity thing where we, we try to get trails that connect all over town. And uh, this would be one area. I'd like to see that trail go all the way to the Connecticut River. And um, that's always, I, I love that park. And it's near my house, obviously. And I'm... I use it, and I've kayaked there, and uh, I've swum there too. And I think someday it's quite that river has gotten so much cleaner. When I was, when I grew up on it, uh, it was a it, you could smell it a mile away practically. It was it really smelled, but now it's. Uh, I checked the bacteria count, and I went swimming uh, not last summer, but summer before, and uh, I think I think there's a real possibility someday we might put a beach in there, and so uh, looking looking a long way ahead. But um, but thank you. You've done a great job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, I also want to commend the committee for a job well done um, for putting this master plan together. Since we already provided some numbers and the viewing audience had an ability to see the numbers, I just wanted to because I know we've had discussion and the 125,000 that's currently in the budget for uh, that crack through crack. For, for this project, y could you explain a little bit on the phase and what is planned right now for the 125 and future, um, uh, whether or not we're going to go out and try to find funding for this? And uh, can you explain a little bit about that? Because sure. most people will look at this and go like, great, we're going to have a, a park ready to go. But if you can give folks a realistic or uh, projected timeline of, of the project will be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Timeline, I'd have to get back to you on that there. We need to vet it a little bit more in terms of implementation for it. Um, but in terms of dollars, uh, dollar amount for phase one was calling for $306,000, um, which included a, a wide variety of, of, of um, uh, implementation as part of that. Um, if it was reduced down to the 120 with the, the current level of funding, um, it, think setting the priorities for it, it would we would move forward with the uh, the culvert is first and foremost for it uh, we would go th move forward with the parking area the demolition of the house um, trail signage and uh, in privacy fence for the portable toilets and timber clearance so that's something that we would be able to do as immediate um, and that gives us would still give us a remaining balance of what's anticipated numbers for it, it would give us about another fourteen thousand dollars to play with uh, if that was the case so that would hopefully be able to get us off the ground. Um, and then from there, I think that we would want to, uh, it would be easier for us to uh, reach out to for external funding if they saw that the project was moving forward. 
Um, so that would be that would be the plan that I would recommend moving forward with. So this way, if you're going to the Hartford or one of the other corporate sponsors, right, or corporate um, in the area, they could see that we're serious with moving forward with this. So hopefully that answers your question. Just very quickly, uh, I want to echo one thing that uh, Councilor Mann said, and I also commend. I think this is a great plan. I've seen I've seen the evolution of this, and I'm very happy with where we're going. But I want to mention that we, um, as as Councilor Mann said, this is a unknown gem of Bloomfield. A lot of people <laughs> don't know about this park, and usually once every four or five years, we do we do a Trails Day hike back in the Farmington River Park. And because a lot of people don't know about it, we usually get 20 or 30 people who have never been there before. And the, the always reaction is, I didn't know this was here. This is amazing. You can get into, the, you can go to the river in Bloomfield. And of course, you look at our map and that's the upper border, but people just don't know that. So I think, you know, being it, now that we have a plan, we'll phase this in uh, and get this, um, you know, get a lot of the um, communication about it out there so the people know to use this park, I think will be wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a very, very good job um, by the committee, the Parks Committee. Um, however, I have a question. You presented an estimate of the budget. Do you have like an estimate of future revenues for the park? And are we going to have to hire uh, additional staff to, if this goes for, to maintain the park? Because uh, so often what we see is our parks go unmaintained. So. I haven't heard anything about, you know, I see about $306,000 for phase one and in future phases another 200000 for roughly like, what, that's five fifty-six, five hundred and fifty-six thousand 556000 roughly. So that's almost a million dollars. Um, so do we have to add additional staff and what are the future revenues for, um, for, um, for coming in from the rentals of the, uh, the rentals of the, uh, canoes, et cetera? Uh, some of the, most of that would still need to be vetted in terms of the, uh, the rental of the canoes and the kayaks is, is there. That was um, is thrown, is, is a, as an idea. Um, so if we were to move forward, then we would need to explore that a little bit more in order to get those revenue funds for you. In terms of the pavilions for it, we would need to develop a uh, facility <coughs> rental policy for the pavilions in particular, which any of the policies like that would need to come in front of council before we would set those. So we don't have the revenue, uh, anticipated revenues for them presently. Um, I think the biggest uh, side for, for potential revenues would be through the corporate sponsor. So we would need to set a, a specific dollar amount that's, um, adhered to, that, that we adhere to um, for the adoption of the trail for it. But that has yet to be set. Uh, quick question. Have you identified or start to identify any corporate sponsors? Uh, and the case you don't get as much revenue from corporations, what is your other revenue stream to make sure that this plan, as you said, just don't sit on the shelf? Because too often we see plans like this sit on the shelf. Well, if the plan is adopted, it allows us to move forward with outside funding sources, whether it be through grants, through state grants, through the Farms and River Watershed may possibly be able to provide some assistance for us or at least provide some avenues for it. Um, but there are, are quite a few outside funding sources that we would be able to, um, to apply for but we just can't do anything until there's a plan that's adopted. Yep, please. Let me just you. We are hoping that um, President Trump will sign a, the lands bill that went through a couple weeks ago um, because part of that lands bill is the designation of the lower Farmington River as a wild and scenic river. Um, Interestingly enough, um, I worked on that, and, and about six years ago, I actually interviewed Dave Malesko about, you know, if we had some funds, some grant funds available for recreational activities around the river, around the river corridor, because you're somewhat restricted, what would you do? And he said, I would develop, uh, you know, I would see to get funds about developing a master park plan for the Farmington River Park, for Wilcox Park, and for um, the East Coast Greenway. And the point is, um, if we, you know, if we get some funding through the National Park Service, um, actually having this plan done, I think will be very helpful in terms of giving us maybe a little bit more visibility. Um, we should be able to get some small grant funding through that. 
And I also think um, being designated a wild and scenic river helps in terms of generating interest. So I think that is all very helpful. So I'd like to um, add to the fact that we said this at the subcommittee meeting that you all did a great job. I'm even more excited that you're looking for funding not from the town. So um, I'm very impressed with the park plan. I'm probably either 21 or 31, so I don't know where the um, Harmony Little Park is. <laughs> I'm sure I will find out soon. Dave will take me up there. But um, it seems to be a really good plan, and if us passing this plan will help you to get funding, I'm all for it. Thank you. Uh, with that being said, we are in the process right now. Our chair has requested for us to take a park store coming up. We will be more than happy to invite any members to the council to join us if we'd like to. Just uh, one more, one more comment with regard to uh, utilizing the proposed pavilion. Um, I believe that would be a real attractive place for weddings. You know, right by the river and so as not to uh, limit ourselves, uh, something in the design of that pavilion should provide some sort of storage and food locker kind of place, I would think. Something that, just take it into consideration. <laughs> yeah, so um, wholeheartedly agree. So the idea is that when the design for that pavilion takes place, um, we would want to make sure that it's designed in a way that it could, because we also looked at, you know, a fully enclosed uh, building pavilion and um, whether that would be um, the need for that would be there. Um, so after much vetting with the committee, we decided that, you know, the happy meeting would let's start with a partial enclosure. Let's see what the interest is, but let's design it in a way that it can be enclosed in the future. It can be windows and doors. A, a heat pack system could be uh, installed in it so that, you know, during the, uh, the off seasons of the month that they could have weddings or it could be more of a functional facility rental use for the town. So that would be the, that's, that's um, the plan moving forward for that pavilion design was that it would be um, integrated in a way that it could be enclosed in future. I actually came here to talk about the school board budget, but I'd also like to comment on what I just witnessed. I think it's a great idea. I'm embarrassed, actually. Uh, having been, uh, my family's been a member of this community for 62 years, and I've never gone to this park. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I take away my citizenship by, by having missed it all this time. Of course, I was on the other side of the tracks, I guess, but um, it looks like a great idea. A couple of questions I had before I go into my... Um, questions or how many cars do you think that would accommodate any idea well let me throw out a couple of questions and then if that's okay okay um, it looks like it'd be a great place for schools to come for stem um, as they access academic possibilities um, would it be closed at dusk um, because part of my concern would be teenagers or others from various communities using that at night and I've seen parks and places before where there's beer cans and all kinds of things. Uh, that probably would be additional cost. Um, would there be a ranger there? Because I'm assuming, or a park ranger of sorts, because if people are going to be obviously on canoes and kayaks. We want them to have some safety. Uh, and would there be some kind of phone service? Uh, because it's off the beaten path to some extent. If there was an emergency, how would people be impacted and how would you get emergency services there um, which would be additional cost I'm assuming but it looks like a great idea and I'm sure our corporate community would cover at least most of the cost um, if not all the cost all right with that said but I think it's a great idea and I, I'd like to go visit myself because like I said I'm I'm quite embarrassed having about to introduce myself as somebody who's been here quite a long time and have never seen that park I'm sorry hello Okay. Um, my name is Keith Martin. I live at 357 Park Ave in Bloomfield. Uh, as I alluded to, my parents and my family have been here for about 62 years. Um, I've been here off and on. And the reason I came here, oh, and before I get started, good evening 
mayor, deputy mayor, uh, members of the town council, and the Bloomfield community. Um, the last time I came to talk to you, it was regarding the senior center. And you probably heard my active debates and about location. It really wasn't about the center. And as it didn't necessarily work out the way I'd like, it did um, accomplish a couple of things. And they did move that access road from uh, moving to Carmen Air Race, which would have been a disaster this summer, kids going to the pool, et cetera. So I feel as though that debate that I presented and kept going for a while did accomplish something. So I feel good about that. And hopefully my comments about the Board of Ed budget, though I'm sure we'll have a budget and it may be not exactly what I'm looking for, will accomplish something by maybe raising some eyebrows and having people think and have an active discussion. With that said, I did go to the board meeting the other week where they unanimously uh, accepted the budget of about $47 million. Um, and that's for the 2019-2020 school year. Uh, I'm going to reiterate some of these things that were already heard and people that uh, were not there can get some semblance of what took place, though I'm sure there's more information. Uh, of that budget, that was about 10% plus increase in the school board's budget, 7.9% of that budget reflected, as they said, health care costs. There was an additional teachers and support staff. I believe there was 11 teachers and seven support staff that included technology. Um, the 10% plus budget, uh, as I indicated, that was unanimously voted upon by the Board of Ed, uh, was stated to have merely a 2.2% average yearly increase. And that was based on four years under the current superintendent of a zero increase. Um, also boasted was a double-digit increase in the graduation rate, and I'd like to address that as well. Questions that I'd like to address, and I'm sure are going to come up at some point in time, uh, these appear to be new positions regarding those uh, positions that were added. I don't know what schools are slated to receive those positions or personnel and what the schools have done to accomplish uh, the needs of those students prior to getting those new positions. What have they done? Also, would all these positions be additions to the teachers' union? Because we're talking contract talk, so it's a big difference whether they're part of the union or not. How will these additions to the staff impact monetarily overall teaching costs moving forward for the two, next two to five years? Um, because as you indicated, the 7.9% increase in health care costs is the bulk of this um, budget that's been proposed. Now, I went online to get some information because I kind of do my homework. I'm kind of new at this, even though I've become a fixture, but um, I'm a little new at the politics and processes. So I went online to see what I could find out about Bloomfield and what's being reported. And there are several reporting agencies that report on districts throughout the state. I happen to find one, and I'm sure there'll be some discussion about whether this is accurate or not, but at least it's, it's online, it's on the web. Not everything on the web is accurate, but this is what I found, and I did provide that information to the Deputy Mayor along with the transcript of what I'm giving you this evening. Um, one source I did find is called localschooldirectory.com. It's an unaffiliated reporting agency that uh, provides information, as I indicated, on the districts throughout Connecticut. Now, they report it, and I'll get to whether this, how accurate this is, but I'll get to why I'm uh, stating this. They reported that Bloomfield graduation was 59% versus the state average of 82%. That Bloomfield per pupil cost was at $19,229 versus the state average of 14642 They also reported that the total number of students in Bloomfield was 2,158 reported that teachers at 226 teachers, and that Bloomfield Elementary School ranked 625 out of 689 schools. West Hartford in this area was ranked 47 and Farmington 73. Some concerns I have. With zero increases in the last four years, one has to question what has been done to prepare for the spiraling cost of health care. The three major costs that impact school board budgets typically are teacher salaries, health care costs, and busing. At the school board meeting, where this budget was unanimously voted in, there was no discussion on busing costs or how rising teacher salaries would be addressed moving forward. Let me start with busing. My home is 0.6 miles from the high school, and on numerous occasions I've noticed students being picked up for school around the corner from my house on Tyler Street. Most school districts, due to budgetary constraints, have a radius of two miles before students are picked up. 
Now while I recognize that two miles can be a long walk for students, having kid picks, kids picked up 0.6 miles is fiscally irresponsible. I see buses leaving Carmen Air Race School in the afternoon, some with five to seven students on board, others with no students. And these are full-size buses that can accommodate 40 to 50 students. I'm baffled that there is no discussion publicly to review or research reducing busing costs as an option as it represents one of the major Board of Education costs annually. Other than the clear benefits that a zero budget projects to members of the school board, it is also very apparent by this budget projection that the chickens have come home to roost. And as a consequence, deeds done in the past must now be faced by us all. The rising cost of health care did not just spring up out of nowhere. There should have been attention given to this budgetary item through ongoing negotiations each year with the appropriate adjustments, especially with the health care administrator operating in our backyard. Teacher costs due to salaries go up annually. And again, there was no discussion to address teacher contracts impact this year or for the next two to five years. This certainly will be something that could impact significantly future budgets. Will we see another 10% board request when teacher salaries are in the forefront? As members of the school board are certain to point out, data and information found online through alternative sources is not always accurate. Facts and figures don't always tell the whole story. Such is the case with graduation rates reflecting increases, in particular, as they mentioned in our board meeting, a double-digit increase. It's a, it's a big difference. Well, first of all, students, such as the case in graduation, reflects student population. The population in Bloomfield of families and children moving into Bloomfield has been on the decrease. A graduation rate can look much different when there are 300 students graduating versus 100 students graduating. In 2003 and 2004, Bloomfield was highlighted, or it was either three or four. Bloomfield was highlighted in the, at that time, new Hartford Magazine as having one of the top 10 schools in the state, though their average SAT scores were 850. I was questioned by an administrator I was working with at the time. They said, wow, you're from Bloomfield. You guys are doing quite well. And this was uh, another school district, I won't name the name, that felt as though they should have been in the top 10. Now, we had a top 10. We had a number, actually, number one football team in the uh, state. And I think politics, as well as uh, political help, has got what, was what put us in the forefront during that time. But was it real? Was it real news? Did Bloomfield deserve to be in the top ten? Now, I'm from Bloomfield. As I already indicated, grew up in Bloomfield, went to school in Bloomfield, as well as Sinsbury. And I would more than like to have our school ranked top ten in the state. But let's be real. When you have an 850 SAT and just have a top football team, that does not put you in the top ten in the state, especially in what we see. If that was the case, we'd have a lot more students and a lot more families moving to Bloomfield. But some of it is cost. And as we look at, fiscally, the cost of living in Bloomfield, parents are sending their kids to other schools. We already know that. Northwest Catholic, Loomis Jaffe, Kingswood Oxford, or they're just moving to other towns. Because quite frankly, our costs right now are parallel to what you find in West Hartford and Sinsbury. So what would make somebody come to Bloomfield? Which is why we're building these, well, let me move on. I'll be brief, I'm already done. We also regard we also are regarded to have one of the top retirement communities in the country. While many former board members and others moved to South, Clare, South and North Carolina to retire once they've taken what they can from this town. Bloomfield, let's be about Bloomfield. Let's be real in our figures. Let's represent ourselves honestly. And let's make sure this board represents our needs and not the personal needs and political needs and patting each other on the back in such a way so they can move on and improve their lives while the people of Bloomfield still have to suffer under higher taxes, congested transportation. I'm sorry. 
so sorry. You, I'm done. You're done? Okay. So thank you so very All much. Right. Thank right? you. And, um, I know I might have been premature. I didn't realize the meeting was on Thursday. Right. So I'm what sure I was they're watching saying, right. we'll so get that right by Thursday. But right. um, I just want them to get it out right, period. Right. So what I would hope that you do is come to the meeting on Thursday okay. and hear the, the Board of Ed present. Um, I'm encouraged that there are individuals out there looking at the numbers. It is going to be something that the council will have to um, ultimately figure out. We cannot tell the board how to spend their budget, but we will definitely try to be as fiscally responsible as we can in what we um, approve for the board. So please, once again, um, if you can come out Thursday at 7 o'clock, we'll be right here. And my sources of information, I did leave that with the deputy mayor sure. as well as my transcript. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Any, any more? Okay. Um, at this time, we're going to have uh, reports from subcommittees, community service and administration and education. Mm -hmm. Deputy Mayor Curtin. Uh, Madam Mayor, thank you. I have nothing to report on tonight for community service committee. Our meeting is uh, scheduled for tomorrow evening at 630. But I'm going to move on to admin and education. Admin education met on March 4th at 6.30. Uh, receive our monthly report from uh, uh, the Human Service Facility. The construction project is currently on schedule and on budget. I have to say that project uh, has been a big winner so far. Um, uh, that committee and the project, we haven't seen any much of a change order. I know the, uh, the one item that came up, the one critical item that was discussed is the permit, uh, the permanent uh, power to the building, which it was scheduled for March 7th. So hopefully I'll have an update on that uh, by the next uh, uh, committee meeting in, uh, in the month of uh, April. For the public works facility, the project is currently uh, scheduled thus far. Uh, adjustments are being made to address the delay with the MDC um, last month. So hopefully for the water flow issue that was brought up. Uh, in regards to the zoning enforcement uh, report, progress report, uh, Mr. Casella, who is the zoning enforcement officer, uh, the committee submitted a newly revised report that he will currently work with uh, with staff on to present a more um, robust report to the council uh, and the committee going forward uh, in regards to the housing uh, codes and regulations. Um, when under the old business, we had discussion and, and, and action regarding the town attorney. Uh, the committee uh, voted to, to move ahead with the process. Uh, so hopefully there is tentative uh, time schedule sometime in the month of April to go through the interview process with the three law firms that uh, were selected uh, at that point. I'm not going to touch uh, base on the, the Farmington River Park that everyone heard tonight. That was also presented to the committee. Discussion and status update regarding the partnership between the, the town of Bloomfield and BA Access Television. I know currently um, uh, during the meeting, we discuss uh, a lease agreement with uh, BATV for the new building before they go into the building. So we're currently working on a draft um, lease uh, with our uh, town attorney. And I know there were some also some concessions that we need to make with BATV to have some sort of uh, understanding with programming and so on with, with the town. So that discussion will continue and, and hopefully have something to report back uh, uh, next month. Uh, the next, the next item that came up was the T21, um, the T21 ordinance that was presented to the council. Uh, we had a robust discussion about that. Uh, currently, our state legislators have roughly around 12 or so bills that are bouncing around there at the capital. So I think at this point, the committee did move, did vote to move ahead to continue the research. But I think at this time, I think it would be more prudent for the town to kind of lay back and wait to see exactly what our um, delegation at the Capitol will do as far as the bill goes, because whatever they do, you know, may contradict what Bloomfield has passed. So I think at this time, I think the entire um, committee agreed and, and hopefully the council that it's better to kind of hold off on passing any local ordinance. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to move on to discussion and startups update with, uh, in regards to the minority contract set aside program. We had a, b a brief update. I think we still need to have some more additional work done. Um, I know the town manager and staff will be working with uh, the minority uh, con uh, my uh, the MCC minority, um, which it is uh, uh, Miss Construction Council, to come up with a. A, a formal report that the, the committee and the council can uh, can move on. Uh, under new business, uh, we discuss a uh, a traffic study uh, for the town of Bloomfield. Uh, we're in the preliminary phase. Uh, we're going to be working with Mr. Uh, Jonathan Thesey, who is the town engineer, to come up with a report uh, to the committee and to the, the town council uh, to look into that. Um, we had discussion regarding solicitation of fund, uh, funding to support community activities. Uh, we receive an opinion from our town, town attorney in regards to that. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think it's important to realize that this council at least uh, uh, have been trying to find ways to bring certain community initiatives. And in order to do that, we are looking for funding from various activities. But that also creates a complication in a sense where, you know, we can't go out to a certain company that's going to be looking towards the town for some sort of a contract or an abatement or whatever the case may be. So there's some legal complications there. So I think based on the opinion that uh, I think we're in the clear right now, we have to always think of these, uh, these issues because we know folks are watching and there is a lot of uh, foyer uh, in the last uh, year or so. So I think right now, I think everyone is comfortable, the committee and so on, that uh, we're, we're in a good position. And, and that's my final report, Madam Mayor. Finance, Councilor Goff. Uh, this will be very quick. Uh, we, have, we have not met since the last, um, last meeting when I gave the report of uh, February's Finance Committee meeting. Uh, and it is budget season. As you heard tonight, we're getting a preliminary, uh, some preliminary comments on the Board of Ed budget. Uh, as part of the town budget. So we will be host, uh, having a series of meetings uh, over the next month. We urge all residents to come out. But because of that and because our focus is the budget meeting, we will not be having a uh, finance committee, subcommittee meeting in March. There's really no reason for it. Uh, we will be focused on the budget. So with that in mind, uh, stay tuned for April. Thank you. Public Safety, Council McLeary. No major updates. Uh, committees on Committee and Land Use and Economic Development, Councilor Mann. Uh, Madam Mayor, the Committee on Committee uh, also did not meet since our last uh, council meeting. So we reported last time of uh, the previous meeting, which uh, we meet once a month. So there's two council meetings every month. So invariably, uh, one of them uh, we will miss out on a meeting. Uh, we are, we're scheduled to have our next Committee on Committees meeting next Monday, the, third, the 18th. Uh, land use and economic development supposedly on the 19th, but there might be a conflict with the budget, so we're looking for another day. Nothing more to report. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Council Old Business 1516-12, consider and take action regarding the Farmington River Park Plan. Do you I'd like to make a motion that we accept the um, plan as presented to us. Second. Oh. Are there any discussions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Um, 1819-49 on the new business, consider and take action regarding tax refunds. Madam Mayor. Uh, I would move that we approve the tax refunds uh, in, court in uh, accordance with the memorandum dated March 7, 2009. And now with our new audiovisual system, you can, uh, the public can see the tax uh, uh, refund list that we are uh, proposing. So uh, with that in mind, I would move that we accept the tax refunds. Second. All in, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. At this time, um, we're going to have a financial report. Good evening. 
Um, so this is for January 2019. The tax collection rate is currently 95.36%. It's a little bit lower than it was as of last year. Um, last year it was 95.78, but um, still no worry. We're about 98.7% of the budgeted revenue we've collected so far to date, which is good. Some other highlights for revenue. Um, building permits finished finished the month strong. That was mainly because of a $488,000 building permit fee from CREC for their new school. Uh, real estate conveyance tax also finished that month, January strong. Um, and that was mainly because of the heirloom flat sale, sale for $61 million. That gave us about $315,000 in uh, real estate conveyance tax. Some other additional revenue, which um, I've increased the projections, are our interest on investment. We've been getting strong um, interest rates, which is good. So I increased that about $270,000. And our mis miscellaneous revenue is up about one hundred and thirty, dollars And that was uh, mainly due to an anticipated member payment from Kerma. <coughs> our expenditures are tracking on point. Um, we should be about 58.33% as of the end of January, and we're 58.5%. Um, but because we have such large payments like debt service or MDC, they're on a quarterly basis. Um, it kind of um, skews the number a little bit. Um, I do believe that our expenditures are going to be um, on budget, if not under, by the end of the year. There are two departments that might be, um, I might be coming to you in the fourth quarter for a transfer, and that's the Register of Voters. Um, as you know, we have new Register of Voters, so there's been a little bit of an increase in training and, and staffing while the transition happens. And also, they had the special election in for District 5 that was unbudgeted. And also, planning... Um, there it was a there was a new hire, an unbudgeted position for the environmental planner. Hopefully, we'll have savings in that department to cover that expense. Um, we'll know more more later. But um, that's pretty much it. Any questions? You meant District One, or you said five? Oh, yeah, District. district one. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, report from our town manager. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor. A couple of things uh, to recognize, uh, and some of this has already been mentioned. Our budget process for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, the FY 1920 fiscal year, will be starting this Thursday at 7 p.m. with a presentation by the Board of Education, followed by the uh, town on the overview, really, of the budget at this point in the process. As we all know, the budget is a uh, kind of a, a long, involved, and, and living process with new data being obtained all the time. I think some of the major issues that are still out there that we don't uh, have a firm uh, ground on include the state budget and some of the uh, potential legislation that would transfer significant uh, costs potentially to the town in the form of lost revenue or uh, added expenditures. And we'll be talking about that on Thursday evening. So I would urge you to either attend or tune in, and uh, it will give you a good start on our budget deliberations that will be taking place over the next month or so. Secondly, uh, we're about ready to publish the uh, March uh, Town Newsletter. And I think in there you'll find a really great and expanded number of programs that the town is offering in our uh, leisure services department, our senior services department, and also uh, with the library, the Prosser Library. So I would urge you to take a look at that newsletter. It's, it's hard to believe, but we're already starting to see sign-ups being scheduled for spring and summer events. So uh, get in early, take a look at the newsletter and or our web page and uh, you can start to plan your uh, activities for this for this coming uh, year. Uh, lastly, I'd like to mention that on April 13th, we are sponsoring our fourth Shred Day. That will take place here at the Town Hall between 10 and 2 p.m. 
There will be information also in the newsletter about that, as well as on our web page. So that completes my report. Thank you. Um, just as a way of update for our town manager search, on this Wednesday, we will be conducting um, interviews, Skype interviews, with I believe it's five um, individuals that have made it through the process thus far. Um, we know that Randy Frank, our executive search firm, came and had a series of meetings here with us in town. They put out the proposal. They whittled down their uh, respondents, and we have five candidates. The council has a book on the candidates. We've looked through their qualifications and their backgrounds. We will have a interview session on Wednesday. Um, I'll be able to give more information after that interview session as to our next steps. Um, I'm going to ask once again, please, this budget is so important that I'm going to ask you not to stay home. I know it's easy to stay home and watch it on TV, but I believe that you need to be here in the audience to hear and to understand everything that's being considered. Um, so please come out to the budget sessions. I do want to talk about... Um, uh, I went to a um, hearing on last Wednesday um, with Senator McCory and the Education Committee um, along with State Rep Bobby Gibson on the importance of African American studies being taught in school and it being a core class. It was so wonderful to see young people come out and advocate for themselves and the importance of this class to them. So if our young people can come out and advocate for themselves, we can definitely sit here and advocate for them as well. So please get involved. It's absolutely, absolutely very important. With that, I'm going to ask for an approval of minutes from our February 25th, 2019 council meeting. Mm -hmm. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. At this time, we will have council comments. I will start with Council Waterhouse. I just want to say thank you for coming out and stay tuned for budget meetings. Please come. Mm -hmm. Council Merritt? I'd like to uh, comment on the how happy I am to see that we're moving ahead with the building committee for the library. I've been asked by many people about that and it is the intent that I understand the mayor is put to putting together a building committee as we speak and um, this will be the first step to decide what it's going to take several years probably to come up exactly with what we want but uh, we need to get started because if you, there's so many questions we have to answer that need, need a building committee so I'm, I'd like to Thank her for her efforts in that line. So. Councilor McClary? No comment. Councilor Goff? One comment, budget. <laughs> Thank you. Councilor Mann? Okay, well, that's a short comment. All right. Um, I had um, just wanted to comment that uh, last night I took advantage of some of the town services. I went with the seniors to Mohegan Sun to see a basketball game, and I quite was extremely excited. I, it was about 35 people on a bus, and uh, everybody had a great time. Uh, these are services that I never was aware of, and I'm sure a lot of people out there may not be aware of. So uh, from my experience, uh, give it a shot. There's a lot going on that the town provides, and I hope that you'll participate. Um, I also was asked to uh, make an announcement that the uh, Bloomfield Raiders Youth Football and Cheer League is holding their second and final registration on March 20th. So if that's at the Bloomfield Leisure Services uh, at 7 to 8 p.m. So I encourage anybody that has a, a youth that wants to play football or cheer to show up and participate. Thank you. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I just want to also just comment on the budget. I just want our residents to know that this is a very important budget process. And uh, as the mayor stated, I think if you come out and let your voices be heard, that's important. Uh, I think we have to be realistic. There's a lot of uncertainty on a state level of what's going on. 
and I think we're going to have to be really careful because a lot of folks are hurting in our town. Okay, a lot of folks are hurting, and uh, I think we're going to have to to make sure that the needs and wants are separated, and we're going to have to do the right thing. So, thank you. I encourage you to come out. Come out on the on Thursday, uh, the fourteenth, uh, to the board of ed meeting. Thank you. Have a good night. So, can't say it often enough. Budget season is coming. It's upon us. And we're dealing with it, and I think we should deal with it together as a town. I also want to say happy Women's Month to every woman out there um, and every woman up here. We rock, and we're writing history every day. So I salute you. Happy Women's Month. Thank you for being here, those that came out tonight. We greatly appreciate your support. This council needs the continued support of our residents in helping us as we deliberate to make the best decision for our town. Thank you very much. Is there a motion? So move. <laughs> Any discussion? So move. All in favor? Right. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you.